Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth edition of the American Sports Medicine Institute's Masterclass webinar series. Uh, tonight's masterclass will discuss common foot and ankle injuries in sports. Uh, my name is Dr. J. Marvadia. I'm a non-surgical orthopedic and sports medicine physician with Andrew Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Center here in Birmingham, Alabama, as well as a graduate of the ASMI Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship Program. I'll be the moderator for tonight's session. Before I introduce tonight's faculty, I'd like to cover, cover a few housekeeping points. Uh, we will address questions uh, during a panel discussion at the end of the presentations. Please submit questions for the panel using the QA button on the Zoom uh, platform at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those watching on YouTube and Facebook, uh, please send an email to ASMI's Educational Services Coordinator, Caroline May, at Caroline M, as in Mary, at ASMI.org with your name and credentials, MD, athletic trainer, physical therapist, et cetera, to receive your certificate for tonight's session. CME and CEU credits will be emailed in approximately two weeks. Uh, participants other than medical doctors and athletic trainers will receive a certificate of, of attendance uh, that can be presented to your professions board to receive credit for tonight's session. When you receive your certificate, there will also be a link to SurveyMonkey asking about your educational experience tonight your reactions and comments will help us determine whether or not this activity has met your needs. Your comments will also provide a basis for future improvements in our activities. All right, now let's meet our faculty members. Our first pre presenter tonight will be Dr. Joss Metzel. Dr. Metzel is an orthopedic surgeon at UC Health Sedman Hawkins Clinic, Denver, specializing in sports medicine and more specifically foot and ankle surgery. Uh, Dr. Metzel graduated from the University of Missouri School of Medicine, then completed an orthopedic surgery residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital, uh, followed by a foot and ankle, sorry, followed by a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery at Ortho Carolina in Charlotte. Dr. Metzel's topic will be treatment of Jones fractures and Achilles ruptures. In addition to his clinical work, Josh is the head orthopedic surgeon uh, for the Colorado Ballet. He's also a assistant team physician for the NFL's Denver Broncos, and Major League Baseball's Colorado Rockies. Next up will be Dr. Uh, Dr. Norman Waldrop, who is orthopedic surgeon, and foot and ankle specialist here at Andrews Sports Medicine in Birmingham, Alabama. Dr. Waldrop will share his philosophy on treatment for high ankle sprains and turf toe. Dr. Waldrop graduated from the University of Alabama School of Medicine here in Birmingham, then completed an orthopedic residency at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, followed by a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery at the Stedman Clinic in Vail, Colorado. Norman is a consultant for all the schools that Andrew Sports Medicine provides sideline coverage for and is directly involved with the care of athletes at the University of Alabama. Last but certainly not least, Jeremy Gazelle is the uh, Director of Rehabilitation Services for the University of Alabama football program. He will talk to you tonight about rehabilitation of the foot and ankle. As you know, Jeremy and his colleagues have received lots of media attention for their ability to get some extremely prominent football players back on the field quickly, but safely. Jeremy earned, earned his undergraduate degree in physical education with an emphasis in athletic training from Salisbury University, followed by a master's degree in human environmental sciences, focusing on sports management from the University of Alabama. He began his career with an athletic training internship working for the NFL's Indianapolis Colts. From there, Jeremy has been on the athletic training staffs at the University of Southern Mississippi and, of course, the University of Alabama. After Jeremy's presentation, we'll have some time for a panel discussion, as well as answer questions from the audience. So with that introduction, welcome everyone. And Dr. Metzl, please get us started. Thank you very much. Are you able to see that? Uh, yes. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor. Uh, and I'm thrilled to uh, learn from my colleagues as well later in the evening. So I'm going to speak to you today first about uh, minimally invasive Achilles tendon repair, and then we will move on to Jones fractures. So Achilles tendon ruptures uh, have an incidence of about 18 per 100,000. And it's most common typically in the weekend warrior ages 20 to 40. And I like to divide uh, the treatment of Achilles ruptures into non-operative management and operative management. And operative management can now be further subdivided into open repair and minimally invasive repair, which is really the subject of this talk. 
So unfortunately, we don't have enough time. We could probably have an entire evening discussion on only the literature surrounding Achilles ruptures and their treatment. Um, but I wanted to highlight uh, kind of the, uh, the recent literature regarding operative and non-operative treatment. Proponents, proponents of operative treatment cite a decreased risk of re-rupture, accelerated rehabilitation, increased plantar flexion strength. And I think more recently, there's been some interesting papers looking at uh, increased sol uh, soleus uh, size and less soleus atrophy in operatively treated Achilles and the ability to restore resting tension. Proponents of non-operative treatment cite a decreased risk, risk of wound complications, decreased risk of infection and decreased risk of nerve injury, in particular, the sural nerve. So really the first description of percutaneous or minimally invasive Achilles repair was actually in 1977 by two authors, Ma and Griffith. And they described multiple stab incisions to perform a minimally invasive repair of the Achilles tendon. They were able to restore tendon length and continuity with minor complications and no infections. However, subsequent studies uh, had higher complication rates and it was difficult to reproduce their initial results, but this was really the first attempt at a minimally invasive repair. Uh, subsequently, in 2002, Matt Assal published in JBJS on 82 patients treated with the Acalon device. This was a, a device that was placed uh, up uh, next to the Achilles tendon and allowed percutaneous uh, passage of sutures. Uh, actually, the, the results from this study were quite good with high AOFAS scores and only three re-ruptures. However, there were concerns with the jig. It was non-anatomic. And importantly, there was no ability to create lock sutures, which does give additional strength to the repair. It was also quite expensive. My introduction to minimally invasive Achilles repair came during my fellowship year in Charlotte when I was able to publish on the initial experience utilizing the PARS uh, percutaneous Achilles repair technique. Uh, so actually our uh, results were quite good. Uh, this was 28 patients, 26 out of 28 were satisfied. Average time to return to sport was 16 weeks, which has uh, also been shown in, in subsequent studies. And importantly, at both six and 12 months, there was no significant difference between the operative and non-operative side comparing strength. And this is what I was referring to earlier when comparing the PARS device, which is this newer percutaneous Achilles jig to the Acalon or the older device, the PARS actually, because we're able to create one or even two lock sutures around the tendon, is that there's less um, cycles of gapping to repair in a biomechanical study and higher load to failure. So the creation of the lock suture has actually been very important in the development of percutaneous Achilles repair technique. Again, I think uh, subsequent studies have reinforced these initial findings. This is a recent JBJS uh, meta-analysis looking at multiple studies and showing that um, there's a decreased risk of complications, in particular wound, uh, wound complications utilizing percutaneous Achilles repair with higher outcome measures and faster return to sport. Um, so I wanted to uh, show you uh, what uh, for me would be an ideal patient for a percutaneous Achilles repair 21-year-old male with clearly a loss of resting tone, abnormal Thompson test, and a step off at the site of Achilles rupture. So um, you can see the MRI shows a kind of classic uh, Achilles rupture pattern, five centimeters proximal to the calcaneal insertion. And this is really an ideal patient for, for this technique. There's a nice distal stump. And so the, the first thing we're gonna do is, is um, make a two centimeter incision at the rupture site. Uh, I like to make the incision transverse. I think it uh, allows for nice soft tissue closure. And we pass this uh, percutaneous Achilles repair jig up uh, into the peritoneum. It's very important that the jig goes into the peritoneum because this uh, protects the sural nerve. If you look at many of the publications on percutaneous Achilles repair, you'll read about um, sural nerve injury. If you stay within the peritoneum, the risk of nerve injury is actually much, much less because the, the sural nerve uh, uh, rests outside the peritoneum. So you pass the jig uh, within the peritoneum and then you pass sutures sequentially through the tendon you remove the jig and then you're actually able to create one or two locked sutures using a looped suture shuttle technique. Uh, it looks a little bit confusing the first time you do it, but um, I think after you do it several times, it becomes much more straightforward. You then pass the device distally, create the same lock suture. Here I am removing the jig. And then um, it's very important here uh, to place the foot in maximum plantar flexion and then you tie the, the suture sequentially. 
the idea of placing the foot in maximum uh, plantar affection is actually well supported in the literature as well. Again, a recent study showing that age and tightness of repair are the best predictors, predictors of post-operative strength after Achilles rupture. And this is something that Dr. Waldrop and I uh, were both taught by our men, uh, one of our mentors, Dr. Anderson in surgery. And he always told us, if the patient does not leave the operating room looking like a ballerina, you haven't done your job. So uh, the idea is that you need to repair these in maximum plantar flexion. And I think I think it's been well supported in literature as well. Um, so you can see it's a cosmetic repair. This is before we've placed any sutures. You can see that the, the edges have come together nicely. And then comparing those tests that I showed you earlier, uh, there's no longer a step off. You can see the resting position has been restored. An excellent restoration of the time of the time. Test. Um, this is a relatively uh, quick case. And so I think that the less tourniquet time, the less soft tissue dissection, it allows our athletes to return to playing faster. And by six Operatively, the majority of these incisions have healed. Uh, very, very minimal tissue uh, swelling, and the patients are doing well in terms of recovery. Uh, if you have any concerns about a transverse incision, certainly a vertical incision is a vertical incision is quite reasonable as well. And here's another case of a of a 22 year old patient of mine who sustained his Achilles rupture uh, on his pro day. So he's just about to kind of attain his lifelong goal of reaching the NFL, and he ruptures his Achilles. So his his main goal was that he wanted to get back as quickly as possible. And I think this uh, here's his MRI. You can see a kind of classic Achilles rupture pattern. This is a great indication for um, tendon to bone fixation. I think it really does help accelerate recovery. We place that PARS device proximally, and then we anchor the PARS device down distally using uh, anchors into the calcaneus. So again, we place the PARS device, we create our lock sutures, we then retrieve the sutures from proximal to distal through two uh, small incisions at the calcaneus. We then drill and tap into the calcaneus to create a path for our swivel lock anchors. Oh. My lights just went out, but they're back on. So we drill and tap uh, into the calcaneus to create a path for these anchors. And then we place the anchors once again in maximum plantar flexion. And you can see here, again, excellent restoration of the Thompson test. Uh, the resting tone uh, is, significant, is significantly improved. And uh, again, this is well supported in the, the literature. This is a biomechanical study showing that tendon to bone uh, fixation, as I just showed you, has less repair site displacement and higher peak load to failure compared to, to uh, suture only Achilles repair. So the post-operative protocol, we, we place these patients for two weeks into a splint, then progressive weight bearing. We tend to have them peel lift starting at six weeks with a plan to return to a shoe by eight weeks and four to six months return to sport. You can see here using uh, some of these techniques, by eight weeks, this is one of our CSU alignment, we have a non-intelligent gait pattern. And because we're able to accelerate their rehab using this uh, tendon to bone fixation, by 12 weeks, he's able to performing agility drills. And by 16 weeks, he's actually ready, ready to return to school. So again, several, uh, several techniques that, that we can use, but I do think for tendon to bone fixation, it's it's quite helpful for accelerating rehabilitation. As a professional dancer that had again this same part speed bridge uh, technique, and by five months he was able to really uh, resume um, many of his dance activities. And lastly, one of our Broncos players, again this is seven months, again a little bit longer on his rehab, was able to come back and, and do nicely on Monday night football. So I think uh, in summary, uh, I think there really has been a, a great trend towards percutaneous um, Achilles repair. Uh, I've had really excellent results with uh, my patients. I think it accelerates rehabilitation. I think there's uh, much less post-operative pain. I think uh, that uh, the clinical outcomes have, have uh, been Thank you very much. All right, we'll switch gears to Jones fractures. Are you able to see that screen? Yes, sir. Great. All right, excellent. So switching gears, I'm gonna to talk to you about the diagnosis and treatment of Jones fractures. Um, so Jones fractures are common, but um, th these can be very difficult stress fractures um, in athletes. And actually, in terms of, of field athletes, um, you know, sometimes as up to 
to um, 20% of all foot and ankle injuries, um, you know, on some teams. So I think that, uh, you know, this is a fracture that we see, uh, but it can be very difficult for athletes to rehab from these. And I think Part of the reason why is that proper treatment does not guarantee success. So even if we do everything right, the surgery is perfect, the rehab is perfect, the patient does all um, does everything that they're supposed to, restrictive weight bearing, they still can have uh, a challenging um, return to activity and sometimes require uh, more procedures. So I think it's important to really understand these fractures and everything that we can do to try and help our athletes achieve an excellent outcome. So what is a Jones fracture? Well, it's a, it's a fracture at the four five metadiaphyseal junction uh, at that articulation. And you can see here kind of zone two, that's the true Jones fracture. Zone three is a stress fracture and zone one is an avulsion fracture. So very important when we talk about zone fra uh, Jones fractures that we're talking about these zone two fractures. Um, so kind of looking at the, at, at the different fractures of the fifth metatarsal, the zone one or tuberosity fracture, typically um, those are, uh, are intra or they can sometimes be extra articular. Um, they're typically treated non-operatively, hard, hard sold shoe or an orthosis. When they're large and intra articular in particular, if we see significant displacement, we can fix these either one screw or a small plate. Um, so but typically these are treated without surgery, but I just wanted to, to show it to you uh, so, that, so that you see it. You can see this case here um, with, with uh, this kind of minimally displaced fracture that was treated with a single screw and the athlete went on to do quite well. Um, so when we think about zone three fractures, those are more uh, kind of uh, diaphyseal stress fractures. And actually these are very similar to Jones fractures in that um, we typically operate on them. But that being said, they can be more difficult to heal than, than the true Jones fracture. So something to keep in mind, these are called the zone three fractures. And you can see here, they, they come out into the diaphysis of the fifth metatarsal. Um, Patients often want to know why why did I sustain this Jones fracture? Why am I here today? And I think the answer is that it's multifactorial. Um, is it shoe wear? Are the shoes too narrow, causing lateral foot overhang? Are the shoes too flexible? We see this quite frequently in football, um, especially in certain positions. Athletes wanting to wear uh, wanting to wear flexible shoes. Is it cable varus deformity? Um, placing increased pr pressure on the lateral aspect of the foot, or more recently, is it metatarsus adductus? That's really um, the finding that we see in many of the MBA athletes that sustain these Jones fractures. So really the, the idea is that it's multifactorial. And um, in particular, the, the reason why these fractures are, are difficult to heal is because it's a vascular watershed, actually very similar to the Achilles tendon. Um, there is retrograde blood flow uh, at the fifth metatarsal and the fracture can extend right through, uh, right through the artery. So that can uh, uh, diminish blood flow to the fracture site and kind of um, make uh, fracture healing more difficult. So when we think about the non-operative treatment of Jones fractures, I think it's, it is important to at least understand that there, there are good uh, descriptions in the literature of non-operative treatment. That being said, it requires prolonged immobilization. Torg is really who has uh, a orthopedic surgeon out of Philadelphia has really published um, the most on non-operative treatment, but it's six weeks non-weight bearing in a cast and it's six weeks weight bearing in a cast. So you're looking at three months of immobilization, which I think uh, I'm, I'm sure as we'll hear, hear uh, later from Jeremy, three months of immobilization is not ideal in terms of returning an elite level athlete back to sport. So um, in, in addition to atrophy with non-operative treatment, there's also a risk of non-union, delayed union and refracture. Even with three months of immobilization, it, it is it, it certainly is described to see um, refractures. So I think this is why really the trend has been to operative fixation in these fractures, especially in an athletic patient population. So the threshold is decreasing, it's low morbidity, especially when you compare that to a symptomatic non-union or refracture. Um, really any athlete, and that can be a weekend warrior, that could be you know, a middle-aged athlete, or in particular high level of professional athletes. Um, any non-union or refracture typically requires surgery. And then any patient with mechanical overload, met, uh, metatarsis adductus, or excuse me, cavus foot position. So um, the typical treatment for these fractures is percutaneous uh, screw placement. And then we can also consider uh, an, uh, uh, augmenting this with um, open, uh, open bone grafting as well. So when we think about um, fixation options for fifth metatarsals, this has really evolved tremendously in the past even five to 10 years. So uh, 10 years ago, there was the option was a single cannulated screw or a single solid screw. Now we have 
um, cannulated uh, uh, kind of uh, implants, which I can show you shortly, with um, where you can place a solid screw. We have stainless and titanium. When we think about uh, titanium uh, having a, uh, a modulus closer to bone, we have headed or headless screws, and we think about um, decreasing the risk of um, cuboid impingement. And there are also fifth metatarsal specific plates. Uh, typically, we worried about lateral prominence, although these new more anatomic plates have really um, uh, decreased that. And so certainly thinking about plantar plating is not unreasonable at all. So um, again, these are just some of uh, the, the Jones fracture systems. And I just show you this so that you understand that I uh, know this has become a very nuanced surgery with very specific uh, implants that are available for um, orthopedic doctors to use. So you can see here, this is um, solid screws, cannulated drills and taps that makes the surgery much more straightforward. There are multiple sizes of solid screw given that each patient has a different uh, size fifth metatarsal. There are, again, uh, multiple sizes of hook plates that you can use for primary or revision cases. So um, with any Jones fracture, and this is the same with any intramedullary device, the most important part of the case is the starting point. The fifth metatarsal is a curved bone, and so it's key to get the um, starting point high and inside and right down the, essentially straight down the canal. Um, the threads are meant to go just past the fracture site. We are not prophylaxing the bone in its entirety, and the reason why is because as the threads extend past the fracture site, uh, they can cause plantar lateral gapping if, if the, uh, the screw is too long. So um, it's very important to, to pay close attention to the location of the threads. I like to start the K wire by hand, and then I place the cannulated drill, and then I switch to the solid drill, and then, and then I tap, and I do this all under fluoroscopy. And you can see here, again, the, uh, the K wires um, heading down into the canal, and we check that on multiple um, fluoroscopic images, and that's the solid drill going down past the fracture site. And uh, you can see here, um, during the surgery, we might also elect in a certain patient to prep out the iliac crest. And we would do that to draw um, bone marrow aspirate from the iliac crest, which we can then concentrate. Uh, so here we are with drawing the, the bone marrow aspirate from the iliac crest. And then we can then concentrate that and inject that down uh, at the fracture site, either before or after um, placement of our Jones fracture screw. So uh, you can see um, there are also adjuvants for healing that are available for patients as well. Um, vitamin D, there are actually are some studies showing that um, low vitamin D increases the risk of stress fracture. And so I think it's very reasonable to either check vitamin D in these patients or simply treat them uh, with vitamin D3. Uh, also low intensity pulsed ultrasound actually has um, very uh, reasonable literature in terms of treating Jones fractures and tibial nonunions. Uh, so, the, so I think, uh, be very reasonable on a high-level athlete or any patient where there's a risk of refracture to think about using a bone stimulator. And then also something more controversial, but I, I included for, for being complete is Forteo or, or parathyroid hormone. Um, again, I think something in, in perhaps a high-level athlete or any patient who has a, a risk of refracture to, to consider um, at least exploring a parathyroid hormone for that patient. Um, in terms of rehabilitation, um, the post-operative uh, treatment of these patients is somewhat controversial. We really are trying to maximize an accelerated return to play versus decreasing the risk of refracture. And also, uh, we have to take into consideration when these fractures occur. As this an in-season athlete, it would be very reasonable to try and push their rehab back, understanding that if they return too quickly, they might have a refracture and require a second surgery or is it an optimal time to consider a delayed treatment protocol, four weeks non-weight bearing, and then progress? Um, I think it's important to, to at least remember that there's a published study looking at athletes in the NFL and those that returned faster than 10 weeks had a higher incidence of requiring a second revision surgery. So at least educating the patients that if they do attempt an accelerated rehab protocol, they might require a second operation. And again, Dr. Anderson's uh, kind of uh, experience um, looking at uh, NFL players from 2007 to 2014, um, average return to play was 9.5 weeks and two athletes required a revision surgery, both of which returned to play and there was no association between return to play and refracture. So I think just some important considerations in the rehabilitation of these patients. 
Um, so let's let's just look at a few um, cases here. This is a 23-year-old uh, NFL receiver, came to see me in the office, kind of this very subtle plantar lateral Jones fracture. And you can see there's actually an interesting case where you can see significant marrow edema on his MRI. So he was treated with a 5.5 millimeter screw. You can see the threads just past the fracture site at four months. He was healed asymptomatic and had an excellent return. Again, here's one of our 23-year-old um, Broncos uh, defensive linemen. Again, he had this more acute appearing of kind of zone two, three um, fracture. Uh, in that classification scheme I showed you earlier. He was also treated with a, a single intramedullary screw. And you can see even here by seven months, uh, he's healed on, uh, on uh, at least one of the radiographic views, but on the lateral and the oblique, you can see that uh, that fracture is incompletely healed. He was asymptomatic and he's played multiple years, um, but I think it just goes to show you that these fractures can be very difficult to heal, uh, you know, even especially if you follow them radiographically for a long period of time. And then lastly, this is a 20 year old college soccer player. Um, she had a Jones fracture we, uh, that we fixed. By four months, she had refractured and was symptomatic. And so we revised her with, uh, with a fifth metatarsal plate and she went on to heal. We did remove the plate, but she went on to heal and do quite nicely. So uh, in conclusion, this represents a significant injury to um, any athlete. Technical aspects of fixation are important for success. Multimodal approach, uh, approach to assist for fracture healing and operative fixations recommended um, really for most athletes. It, it allows for a successful return to play, but it is not a guarantee. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. I guess I'll take it over. Um, appreciate you uh, joining us. Uh, for all you out there that are watching, he's, he is currently at the Broncos facility doing, been doing physicals on their, uh, on their incoming players. And uh, so yeah, I appreciate him sneaking off and doing that. That was good stuff, man. Um, I, I appreciate that. So um, let me Pull up mine. All right, we good there? Yes, sir. All right. So I'm gonna talk about high ankle sprain, syndesmosis injuries, and then we're gonna talk about uh, turf toe and then we'll let Jeremy uh, take it at the end. Uh, you may see a little bit of overlap, obviously, because. Um, I worked so closely with Jeremy and uh, you'll get to see some of the uh, um, some of the inside stuff that Jeremy does. Uh, uh, he truly is the most amazing uh, rehab guy that I've worked with. And it's pretty, pretty, pretty incredible. The stuff that he does This his talk will be uh, um, pretty good to see. But I'll give you the background of kind of where we are. I, I am a consultant for Arthrex, which we will talk about an Arthrex product. Um, in this talk a little bit. So for, for those of you kind of talking about syndesmosis and trying to understand it and why um, I treat it the way I do, it's kind of under important to understand the foundation and, and the anatomy behind it. You know, we've, we've had a pretty, pretty long preoccupation for what it is, but, you know, for the longest time, why did we miss so many of those injuries? Why do they take so long to heal? If we're going to fix them, what's our best method? And, and really, by some of these newer techniques, are we really improving our outcomes? And those are sort of the questions that we all have. Going back to the most basic part um, is really the anatomy. It's kind of where it all starts for, for, for surgeons, trainers, athletic trainers, and um, therapists alike. You, you, you got to boil it down to the simple thing. And so understanding the anatomy is critical. The AITFL provides about 35% of the overall strength. And it's, it's really the most important ligament to, exit, to resisting external rotation. Um, the PITFL posteriorly really is two separate bands. It's the, the main portion of the PITFL in conjunction with the transverse tibia fibula ligament makes up about 45, uh, 40 to 45% of the overall strength. And the interosseous ligament, which is the band that runs from the ankle all the way up to the knee, um, provides about 25% of the overall strength. And there's a really classic study done by Ogilvy Harris um, in arthroscopy back in 1994 that was a cutting study that looked at the relative strengths of this. Um, and that's really important to understand when I get into what, what are the things that we're thinking about. And that, that's been uh, since corroborated by my mentor, Dr. Clanton, um, in a journal article in FAI back in 2016, looking at these relative strengths. So 
It's a sickle cell joint. It, it's it's meant to move. It has cartilage on both sides. It's not a static joint. And that's important to think about when how we fix these. But the shape can vary. And it's and and that's really important to understand within the relative anatomy of different patients. And and uh, we're not always the smartest people as orthopedists. So uh, fortunately, the good Lord gave us two. So we can always look at the uninjured side to see what their anatomy is like on the other side. Um, and so that can give us a little key to what normal should look like um, if we're concerned that it's not. This is a dynamic structure, it's not static. So with every step, that fibula moves distally uh, with plantar flexion, it externally rotates. Um, and the external rotation of the fibula is linked with dorsiflexion of the ankle and pushing off. And that intermalleolar distance widens as, we, as the wider part of the talus comes into contact with the mortise as we go to push off. And if you think about this, this has an implication for screws for the, for the physicians or surgeons who use screws to fix these because it's not a static joint. And when you're using a screw, it's pinning the fibula to the tibia. Uh, whereas other modes of fixation can allow for, um, for that normal motion. So when, uh, when we're thinking about it, we're looking at a strong external rotation force through the ankle. And, and typically, um, typically what we see is in contact sports and in, in football, um, in skiing and lacrosse and hockey, those are the most common sports. This is not an injury um, seen in, in everyday life. Um, and, and that's important to understand. Um, really, the external rotation mechanism is suggestive. Um, you have to evaluate the entire extremity though. Look up, look upstairs, look at the knee. Do they have a mason of fractured? Um, what does the squeeze test tell you? If you, uh, if you squeeze at the mid shaft, are they having pain at the ankle? Uh, what, it, what happens with the external rotations test? Uh, when the patient's sitting, you wanna hold the knee flexed. You wanna externally rotate through the ankle. And are you eliciting pain and discomfort? If they can't tolerate that, you can try a cross leg test using letting gravity do that for you. So when we're, when we're trying to evaluate it radiographically, really we're looking for two things. The medial clear space on the medial side, um, is it congruent with the rest of the ankle? And, and what does the tib-fib clear space look like? What kind of overlap are you seeing uh, with the tibia and the fibula? Um, and and is, that, is that normal and is it equal to their other side? So when we get those x-rays, don't forget we want to look high for the Maisonov fracture. Look low, look at, look at all angles because you may see a little small posterior avulsion fracture of the, of the posterior malleolus, which is really less of a fracture more than it is uh, an avulsion of the uh, PITFL posteriorly. So what is the high ankle sprain? Well, you know, classically in the old school literature, it was really a diagnosis that was made in the rear view mirror. Um, oftentimes they were um, put in the same bucket as, as the ankle sprain, which is one of the issues um, with the name high ankle sprain. Um, and it kind of was diagnosed as in, a little bit in hindsight. Um, it's an injury pattern that goes from a minor strain to a, to a frank rupture. You know, it's the minor strains we know how to treat. The, the one here on the right, we know how to treat. It's those ones in the middle, those grade two ones that are, dif uh, that are difficult. We know what to do with the, with the grade ones. Expect a longer course, but remember, um, there is full expectation that they're gonna have a good, excellent outcome with full return to sports. But too early a turn to return to play can, can restart that entire process. Um, that Amendola, um, who's now at Duke, um, had a good paper showing that. Um, and I use the single leg hop test that um, um, Josh and uh, myself, our mentor, Dr. Anderson, uh, popularized, and it, and it really is a uh, excellent tool. So what about the two ligament injuries? So we're, we're taught that surgical management isn't necessary with, um, if, if with anatomic reduction seen on CT or MRI. Well, is that really the case? Because CTs and MRIs are static tests, and this is a dynamic problem. Um, and so what, what do we see if, if there really are two ligaments injured as there are in this case? Well, if you go back to our, our original cutting studies, if two of the ligaments are injured, you've lost greater than 50% of the stability of the joint. So um, in these grade two injuries, classically, we would treat them non-weight bearing, stick them in a cast for a month and transition them to a cam boot. Um, but at that point, you're looking at six, eight, 10 weeks for recovery. Um, and often that can be uh, difficult. Um, in patients who have a positive squeeze test, they're nine times more likely to be unstable. 
And really importantly, if that tenderness extends uh, five and a half centimeters above the ankle joint, you need to be, you need to have a high threshold, uh, or excuse me, a low threshold for getting an MRI because this is likely to be uh, more unstable. And and those that were unstable missed twice as much time in return to sport, and that makes sense. And so we need to get better at diagnosing those. So should we consider early surgery? That's kind of the the, the question. You know, how aggressive should we be? Are we being too aggressive? But what about that one that comes in that was treated non-operatively that's three months down the road and they still can't play? And you say, well, we should have fixed that. And we got to get better at identifying those. And so that's kind of where we really stand. So the average return to play um, in a really well done study out of West Point, um, uh, re average return to uh, for their cadets, for military cadets who sustained injuries um, uh, like this was about 55 days. So you're looking at you're looking at two months uh, for for normal return to play. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, but that that five centimeter uh, line tends to be critical. If if they if they are tender five centimeters above the ankle joint, you need to be thinking about a more severe injury. So what are we looking for? This, this applies to really all joints, but. But, but here in particular, we're looking for rotational instability of the joint, posterior translation of the fibula. Um, but relative to the intact state, these conditions really occur at a lesser degree. And Ken Hunt, um, who's there in uh, Denver with, with Dr. Metzl, really showed this well in a, in a study. We were always taught um, in our training that it wasn't unstable until you saw widening of the syndesmosis. Well, what we found is that's not true. Um, that, that we'll see rotational instability and posterior translation of the fibula earlier than that. And so you have a, you'll, you'll have dynamic instability long before you see that widening. And those are the critical ones that we need to catch. So in these cases, what's my algorithm? So I'm looking for that, in, that, that athlete's inability to bear weight. And, and by that, I mean um, bear weight normally. Do they have a positive mid-shaft fibular squeeze test? Are they tender five centimeters above the joint? What about medial deltoid pain, usually anterior medial deltoid pain and pain with external rotation? If you look at those studies I showed, these are the ones we need to be worried about. And, and we always want to get weight-bearing x-rays. They're positive. Obviously, there's, there's an unstable ankle. But oftentimes, they'll have a normal x-ray. And so these are the ones I want to get the MRI on. And if there are two ligaments injured, I recommend an EUA and stress fluoroscopy. And if that syndesmosis is unstable, which once you put them to sleep and they can't uh, protect their ankle with their perineals and their uh, posterior tib, uh, we often find that, that it's unstable in these uh, two ligament injuries. So when we're in surgery, what do we do? Well, I, I would argue that, that screws are the, the, the old way to do it. There's more and more and more and more literature out there um, that says, into button or tightrope, and, and in the case that I, I, I use a tightrope to fix these, it is really the, the best method. So why? Um, well, it's two and a half times stronger than a, than a screw in cyclic loading, and, it, and, and probably most importantly, it avoids the need for removal, and it allows for micro motion. That motion um, that the tightrope allows the ankle and the syndesmosis to do is important for that collagen to heal appropriately and to heal quicker. So I'm going to show a case um, that really highlights sort of our aggressive rehabilitation. This was one of our linemen, um, uh, and you can see here's Jeremy right here. Um, this is one of our linemen who went down against Tennessee. He was unable to bear weight on the field. Um, his immediate x-rays were negative for fracture, uh, but he clearly had a, um, a syndesmosis injury. He had tenderness about eight centimeters extending above the joint line, mild deltoid pain, uh, difficult bearing weight. He had normal weight-bearing x-rays, but you can see here he, he on his MRI, he's got a classic um, syndesmosis injury. Here on the image on the left, you can see the AITFL is torn. You can see the PITFL is injured in the back. We have fluid that's extending out of the ankle into the FHL, which indicates that there's, there's a compromise to the posterior structures. And the highest cut um, of the axial image has fluid extending all the way up the leg. And you can see there's a there's a tear in the interosseous membrane. Uh, and so we have a pretty significant syndesmosis injury here. But when you put him to sleep and stress him, he's clearly unstable. So what do we do? Um, it, I, I arthroscope all of these. And they almost always look the same. And this is a good view of, uh, of posteriorly. Uh, posterior laterally, you'll see me pull down the PITFL here. It's clearly torn off the back of the ankle. Um, and oftentimes, it'll pull a piece of cartilage with it. 
And so there's injury back there to the PITFL as well as the interosseous membrane, which will flip into the joint. And so we have an unstable injury. And so when I scope it, I'm not only looking for, for cartilage injury, I'm also looking to lavage the joint, clean it up, get the, get the pain generating factors out. And then I'll stabilize it with two tight ropes. And over the last couple of years, I've actually gone to using a lateral plate. And the reason I use the lateral plate is if I'm gonna let guys go back um, at an expedited rehabilitation process, one of my biggest concerns is fibula fracture. And so the plate is not there for stabilization of the syndesmosis, really to act as a force dissipator to move the stress across the fibula so it's not concentrated in one small hole around the button and hopefully, hopefully knock on wood, lessen uh, uh, the potential for fracture. I personally have not had one yet, but they are definitely reported out there and there have been some um, even up to the highest levels in the NFL. So I use the plate in an attempt to, to mitigate that a little bit. So after 10 days of aggressive rehabilitation, you know, he, he, he was able to return to practice. Jan, uh, Jeremy will kind of go through some of the specifics about what we do with that. We do follow their GPS data very closely. And after day 12, he passed the 15 uh, single leg hot test. And you can see here his left ankle is, is taped um, and uh, he, he is moving well. Um, and I mentioned the GPS and, and this is one of the th tools that we use to look at how they're doing. Um, and in particular, a guy who's injured his left ankle, I wanna see how he's changing directions and moving to his right how he's pushing off, accelerating and decelerating. And I wanna know how that changes from post-operatively where he's clearly weaker to approach his more normal uh, levels. And when we see a guy who's coming back after surgery, able to accelerate and decelerate normally and change directions normally, we'll feel comfortable letting them go back no matter how quick, whether that's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, when they're able to um, get to their pre-injury level um, we're, we're comfortable letting them go back. And you can see here, in this case, right here, our right tackle, um, he actually played uh, two weeks out from his injury. Um, and here he is against LSU, moving pretty well. He started um, and played the whole game. So post-surgically, uh, we place them in a cold compression device immediately and pack you. I no longer splint them because I think swelling control is critical. I do put them on, I give them Toradol for two doses after surgery. And we started a, an anti-inflammatory post-op day one. I do keep them off of it for the first four days um, because swelling control is critical. And if you don't control the swelling, they won't do well. We do a wound check on post-operative day four. We change the dressing. We begin weight bearing. That's when therapy begins. So we'll focus on the swelling control, the range of motion. Because once their swelling is normal, they get their range of motion back. They feel more comfortable. Weight bearing is tolerated. And once we are able to do that, their gait will normalize and we can put them on the Alter G. Once we get them on the Alter G, I'm looking to see how their gait's progressing. You can see here, this athlete um, has injured his left ankle. And I wanna make sure they're not externally rotating and that they're pushing off and that they're giving each ankle um, sort of equal, uh, equal weight bearing and they're not splinting that side. And once I feel like that gait is normal, uh, and we're able to progress their weight bearing, we'll push them to on land exercises. And once we do that, we'll progress them into a shoe with an ASO brace, start balancing proprioceptive and, and get going from there. And ultimately, um, you know, once we're able to progress them through all this, um, uh, we'll return them to play. When they can pass the single leg hop test um, with a, a validated return to sport test and their GPS numbers tell me that I'm okay with them returning to play. I'll clear the athlete. And it's not based on time. We're using objective data. And if they can go quickly, I don't slow them down. That's one thing I've become very comfortable with and our athletic trainers at the schools that I take care of have become very comfortable with because we have a very good line of communication that if they're feeling good, we'll let them keep continuing on. So ultimately, these injuries are becoming more and more prevalent. Always look for that instability. We want to stress test them. And when you get them um, in surgery, you can assess that arthroscopically. This isn't the same as a typical ankle sprain, doesn't need to be treated as such. So these algorithms of treatment are changing, but ultimately our goals remain the same. We want a stable joint. Um, we want a stable joint that allows the athlete to return the way, uh, um, the way they expect and at full speed without limitations. So I'm gonna to move to turf toe injuries now. And we'll talk a little bit about some of uh, um, some of the ones uh, that, that we've treated, but really turf toe is um, tends to be a little bit of a confusing 
uh, injury for people. So um, really what it is, is a grade three or, or three separate grades of a severity of injury of the plantar surfaces, uh, the plantar surface of the uh, great toe. And it's the ligamentous structures that connect the sesamoids to the proximal phalanx that allow us to have the, the power for push off, not unlike your patella tendon um, is in the knee. Um, and it, that, that, uh, that allows us to get a better mechanism of injury for push off with jumping and running. The mechanism of injury for a turf toe is typically an axial load. It's usually an athlete who gets fallen on from behind with their foot in a plantar flex position, um, an axial load to the back of the ankle that'll hyper dorsiflex the great toe. Mandatory for evaluation in the turf toe is, is x-rays because you can learn a lot um, and it allows you to compare it to the other side have the sesamoids retracted. So really what we wanna do is look at it and see how it compares to the other side. Do they have a bipartite sesamoid uh, like you see here in the bottom right? Have, have they split apart? Um, when doing so, um, we wanna get these weight bearing because that allows us to better evaluate what's happening with those. And if you're suspicious, look at the other side. Do you see sesamoid migration compared to the other side? And if so, you probably have a complete plantar plate rupture. MRI is very helpful. Um, ultimately, it, it's what allows us to sort of understand the very nuances of it. Um, it identifies uh, the various uh, um, uh, damage done. You can see here there's a complete tear as there's no continuity between the proximal phalanx and the sesamoid. Allows us to look at very uh, the subtle injuries and helps with decision making. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is repair the hole which you can see here between the proximal phalanx um, and, the, uh, and the sesamoid ligament. And really, lastly, what we're trying to avoid is this, um, the chronic turf toe um, from neglected injuries. Um, and that's what can lead to long-term problems like hallux rigidus, cock up deformities, weakness with push off and persistent pain. So turf toe is a little more complicated um, and, and certainly it's, uh, um, and it's something that can be easily overlooked um, and it's something that you have to recognize and treat appropriately so we can get the outcomes that we're looking for. Thanks. Jeremy, all you. Sure. All right, hopefully I can, can live up to that high praise here. We got the right view up there? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I appreciate you guys letting me tag on to this. It's, it's exciting for me. And um, this is kind of one of the things, the, the things I like to, to rehab the most. It's just kind of one of my, my favorite areas of the body to take care of. So I could spend a whole lot of time talking about the foot and ankle, um, a lot more time than I have. So what I've decided to do is kind of take a uh, 10,000 foot view of this and kind of pick and choose uh, some of the more important concepts versus just, you know, going verbatim step by step through the rehab process. Um, uh, this is my little assistant here taking help me take care of one of our, our most recent um, ankle injuries that we had. Um, neither one of us obviously have any conflicts of interest. So um, kind of starting off holistically, you know, our mission statement here um, is, is threefold. Um, we like to, to do things in a creative, aggressive, and objective way. Um, we like to call it the kitchen sink method. If it's, if it's legal, ethical, and it's, it's, um, it's safe to do, we're going we're gonna to try it. Um, we like to get creative. You know, our, our athletes get bored easy, and we want to make things as, as exciting for them and, and kind of a change of pace every day so we can get the most out of them as quickly as we can. Um, we walk a fine line. We're very, very aggressive um, with our, our rehabs and how we do things. Um, and I'm no different with that. So as, if foot and ankle respects, if, if Dr. Waldrop's good with it, then, then, then we're going we're gonna to push that envelope a little bit. Um, at the same time with that, we're going to be very, very objective with that. So we're going to use a lot of data-driven methods, a lot of, a lot of numerical things to, to make sure that what we're doing um, is, is making hay. So if, if we're doing something and we're not seeing progress, then, then we need to rethink what we're doing. So but with that being said, um, I teach a rehab class, a rehab lab here at University of Alabama. And this is one thing I tell my students. I don't know everything, but I know someone that does. So I have zero problems, zero ego um, 
with reaching out to people. I'm very fortunate to know a lot of good people in this profession, a lot of good people in rehab. Um, so I have no problems with making sure that I'm, I'm doing everything uh, the most uh, state-of-the-art way, the most current uh, practices and um, changing things up and getting creative. So I'm constantly picking um, the brains of other people in this profession and in rehab to, to make sure I'm doing everything that I possibly can uh, to get my athletes back on the field. The foot and ankle is no different. It's very unique. Um, when we talk about the, sh the, the shoulder, the hip and the knee, typically we're allowing for early motion and movement. So um, from the very beginning, we're, we're kind of moving for the most part. We, we've got the foot on the ground, we're doing things. Foot and ankle are almost always different than that. We, we require a period of non-weight bearing and or immobilization. Um, and, and that's a lot of uh, time that, you know, you can very easily say, well, you just go away and, and we'll come back when the cast comes off and we'll get to work. But, but for us, when we're, you know, every day means something. So what we do with that time uh, can, can very easily determine how quickly we can return this athlete. So those are the things we're gonna kind of talk about today. Um, the first thing is wound care. Um, if you have an issue with a wound and, and, and unfortunately foot and ankle are, are high probability places to have wound issues. Um, so it, this can seriously delay how quickly you can return your athlete to play. So we, in the very beginning, we spend a, a lot of time and effort and money in some cases, making sure that we are, we are getting this wound to heal in the proper amount of time and as quickly as we can get it to heal. Um, but that is in avoiding infections um, and anything that can delay the healing. We're, we're big on the jump start bandages to accelerate the wound, laser treatments. We try to stay away from the wound as much as we can. We keep it clean, we keep it dry, and, and we um, keep the stitches in as long as we need to. I, I always tell people I can take them out late, but I can't put them back in if they come out too early. So. Um, we make sure for sure that our wounds are, are taken care of because that is ultimately the first hurdle we have to overcome. The second thing is we don't stop working the body just because one part gets injured. Like I said, it's very easy to tell that person to go away with your scooter and don't do anything dumb and come back when the cast comes off and we'll get to work. But, but that's not how we operate. I, I want to make sure that th this person stays in the weight room, for example. There's huge benefits to keeping them working out and keeping them in, the, in, in, um, in shape. And the first thing is psychological. Um, these guys can get depressed. They can get sad because they're not playing um, their position. They're, they're seeing their, their friends and their teammates out there doing their thing. And this is what these guys in their minds are born to do, to play football or play whatever sport. So psychologically, keeping them around the team, keeping them engaged in meetings and practice and specifically in the weight room is huge. Um, physiologically is no different. Keeping them lifting the other three extremities that they have that there's nothing wrong with. There's no reason they can't be in the weight room, um, upper body lift and lifting the well leg, um, even doing some open chain exercises with the injured leg. Um, the physiological benefits to that far outweigh the risk. And then cardiovascular, if we can keep them in shape, you know, part of the biggest hurdle to getting somebody back on the field from a, especially a long-term injury is, is cardiovascular, how much work capacity can they have? So if we can keep some of that work capacity then we don't have to make it up in the back. And then again, that translates into a uh, quicker return to play. Um, rehabilitation wise, you know, one of the biggest uh, tools that I have in my toolbox is blood flow restriction. Tons and tons of research um, available on blood flow restriction, probably more than any other modality that I have available to me um, as far as its increased healing time, increased strength, swelling reduction, bone density, uh, decreased cardiovascular, you know, limits to kind of keeping the, the cardiovascular ability from going down. Um, atrophy, I mean, just something as simple as, as, as minimizing atrophy on a body part that's in a cast. Um, blood flow restriction has a huge positive effect on that. Um, and then rehabilitation compliance. This is something I have yet to master in my personal life with my son, um, but I'm, I'm getting better at it with uh, with my patients. Um, the first thing is patient compliance. Do what you are told to do. So um, if we want you to just go continue to go in the weight room and lift and do your cardio, um, you know, use your scooter, stay off your cast, don't walk on it. First thing I do when somebody comes in here with a cast is I look at the bottom of it, see if it's dirty. That means they've been walking on it. Um, so that's, that's important. And then for me, the, the therapist compliance is just as important. I, I have a great relationship with Dr. Waldrop and when he tells me I can do something, I'm going to do it. But if he tells me I can't do something, I'm not going to do it. And that's no different with, with the, the patient. Um, 
I tell my guys all the time, we, we have this um, window. So whatever injury it is, let's say we have, we have three weeks where we're non-weight bearing, we're in a cast, we're in a splint or whatever. Let's just get through this protective phase. If we, if we can get through this without messing it up, we're, we're, we have a home run here. We're ready to go. So that's, that's really, really important is just we can get through that protective phase. We, we, we got a shot. Then we get out of the cast, we get out of the boot, and we, and we can get to work. Um, and the, the range of motion to me is, is the first key to this. Um, and, and that is usually how well we're doing scar management. The, the, the lower extremity, the ankle, the, the, the foot, a uh, huge amount of scarring, is, is, the potential for scarring is there and, and, and how we take care of that um, determines how quickly we get the motion back. Um, and I take a very big hands-on approach to this. So um, a lot of warming modalities, um, a lot of hands-on massage, a lot of tool-aided massage with grass and fat tools, cuppings, things like that, and, and using joint mobilization when appropriate to try and, and, and kind of coax this motion back. So once we get the motion back, then everything else can kind of, kind of fall into place. The biggest thing for me when we, we start rehabbing the foot and ankle is I like to focus on the foot. To me, the foot is the base of the kinetic chain. So I try to spend as much time with the foot health as I can. Um, mobility of the foot, even if it's an ankle injury, the foot is still the base of that ankle. So, so that's kind of the, the, the tip of the spear, I guess. Um, so passive range of motion, active assistive, things like that, working on the range of motion, stretching, again, mobilizations. And then really the, 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 the muscular health and the muscular um, ability of the foot. You know, those intrinsic muscles have been sitting in a cast or sitting in a boot dormant, not working. Um, when you run and you cut and you jump, you know, each of those individual muscles in that foot, they kind of work on their own independently to do their job. And they've been sitting in this cast and they haven't been doing anything. So to wake them up and work on muscle firing and things like that, I like to use these doming exercises that are going on in this video right now. Um, and it's just kind of teaching the independent muscles of the foot to fire by themselves. And that just kind of wakes them up. But when we start talking about getting them strengthened, you know, you can do the towels, the foam, the marbles, things like that. Um, but again, I like to get them on the ground, close chain, single leg exercises as quick as I can, but I don't stop focusing on the foot at that point in time. Um, I like to incorporate intrinsic muscle firing into all of my close chain exercises as best I can. And some examples of that are these pictures where I, I have somebody doing a toe raise, but if I'm gonna do single leg toe raises, I choose to do it on a soft surface because I can get them to activate their feet and, and fire their toes into that foam. Um, so while I'm doing a calf raise, which I'm working on the calf or the soleus or the foot, I can still um, teach them how to fire the muscles in their foot. And if you do this correctly, it burns like fire in the arch of your foot. So we get good foot health. Um, and then there's just another picture there. If you wanna progress it, you can, you can uh, provide some resistance with a band. Um, the other thing that we've found and we've paid a lot of attention to is the posterior tibialis muscle with these injuries. There's a, a lot of research out there talking about inhibition of this muscle, especially after injuries or with, with chronic injuries. So we spend a lot of time focusing on um, isolating this muscle and making sure it's firing properly because the, the stronger this muscle and the better it's firing, the better overall health of the ankle and foot control. And then we just kind of going into progression. The, um, instead of talking specifically about points in progression, we're going to just kind of go over it, you know, uh, holistically. So whether it's range of motion, strength, running, or return to sport, or anywhere in between, um, we're going to go um, as fast as the athlete will tolerate, as fast as the doctors or surgeons are comfortable with. Um, but we got to be really, really careful because we go too fast with this, we're, we're setting ourselves up for a catastrophic problem or a setback. At the same time. Um, if we go too slow, we can cause problems too. So we got to kind of walk that fine line in our progression and, and making sure we're, we're, we're taking our steps when we, when we have the opportunity to. The other thing, um, we're fortunate here. We have a, a lot of nice pools. I love to get these guys in the water and get them in, in the water as quick as I can once the wounds are closed and they're able to weight bear, even if they're able to partial weight bear. Maybe they're not able to 100% weight bear, but maybe they can partial weight bear. Um, Foot and ankle rehabs, the, the foot and ankle injuries do really, really well in the water. They, for, for some reason, to me, they do better than most. Um, and the guys like it for the most part, the guys and girls like it. It's, it's a change of pace. Um, it, it, you're not on the table every day, all day doing the same redundant things. It's just something different. Um, it's a very, very safe place to progress. Um, 
water only pushes as hard on you as you push on it. So if you stop pushing on it, it stops pushing on you. So it's very safe. Um, it also creates a natural pressure gradient. So it helps with swelling, it helps with range of motion, it helps with, with um, scarring and things of that nature. And it's a great starting point for a lot of the things that we progress through with rehab, whether you're, you're talking about walking, gait training, whether you're talking about jogging or running, um, change of direction exercises or even plyometrics, doing it in the water and progressively bringing them out of the water is, is, is no different than, than bench pressing and adding five pounds every day. So it's a really, really safe and convenient place to do that kind of stuff. So we, we like the water a lot. This is kind of something to me, I, you know, people probably don't think about shoes and orthotics when we're talking about rehab, but to us, uh, me and Dr. Waldrop as well, this is a, this is a huge, huge point of emphasis with rehab. Um, when we get out of the boot and start talking about progressing through rehab, we're, we're talking about progressing through shoes as well. So we're going to start with a really, really supportive, really, really wide, rigid shoe to give them as much support as we can. And then we'll progress them down into what they would be wearing before they ever got hurt, keeping in mind that, that we're going to maybe require us to change the shoes that they were using beforehand. Because, um, of course, even the 300-pound linemen that we have think that they're wide receivers and they want to wear the most flimsy, narrow shoe so they can run, you know, a 5-1 instead of a 5-4. So um, we always, I always tell them they're never going to be a Ferrari, so we don't, we don't need to even try. The same thing happens with the cleats. You know, we're going to start with a really, really rigid, supportive cleat, wide cleat, and then we can progress them into something down the road. Um, and then orthotics are a huge component to this as well. We want to make sure that we, we put something in the shoe that puts them in a neutral position, um, something's very supportive. And then if we're, we're dealing with a, a foot or a toe, turf toe, for example, we're going to uh, make some kind of modification for that insole. So. And then I like to get them to close kinetic chain as, as, as quick as I can. Um, I try to, to, to incorporate a, a ton of single leg exercises into these rehabs, but I also want to incorporate the complete chain. I don't just want to focus on the foot or the ankle. That stuff's important too, but I think it's more important to get them up off the ground, um, start doing things that incorporate the entire body from, from the shoulder down, um, get them into some sport specific positions, do things, exercises they would normally do, but, but add things that can cause some perturbation, things like that. The picture on the left is a, is a tidal tank um, and the, the water in that tank constantly moves and constantly provides a change of, of, of balance and requires you to react to it. And then the, the hicko sticks over here where you're having to call out a cover, a color, the, to me, the, the cognitive part of that where they have to actually think about what they're doing. Um, they don't play football in a vacuum. So they, they have to constantly react to what's happening around them. So giving them some stimulus and feedback and requiring them to, to adjust while they're standing on this thing, doing their, their balance exercise is important. And it also distracts them from their injury. They're, these guys tend to get so hyper-focused on, am I going to hurt myself again? You know, they can do more than they think they can so they can, you can get their brain out of the way. They, they tend to impress themselves. And then recovery is just as important now as it ever was. Um, you know, we can only go as fast as, as their body is going to tolerate. Um, they, they get out of shape, they get sore. The injuries naturally get sore. So as we probably spend as much time prepping them for rehab and then taking care of them after rehab so that they can turn around and rehab tomorrow um, as we do actually doing the rehab. So, so these kinds of things, modalities, game readies and medications, compression, and, and then rest when needed. If we've pushed it too hard one day, we need to take a day off, then we need to take a day off. And, and that's, that's important to understand as well. And then finally, Dr. Walter kind of touched on this. Uh, objective data is really, really important to how we operate here. Again, we're, we're extremely aggressive, but we want to make sure that we're aggressive in the right way. So we use a lot of objective measures. Um, for us, it would be, you know, strength-wise, will be Biodex or a Caneo intelligent load system. Um, but it doesn't have to be. You know, not everybody has these, these bells and whistles and toys that we have, and I realize that. But you can get low tech for sure, handheld dynamometers, manual muscle tests, um, just seeing that you can make progress with strength um, and, and have numbers to back up why you're progressing this person. Um, when we're talking about uh, explosive numbers, you know, we, we, we use force plates or, or GPS catapult, but you don't have to. Dr. Walter talked about the hop test. That's a very low budget. You know, it just needs a tape measure. So you can get the same kind of results with that. Um, we don't have GPS on the field. How many reps can they take? 
before they start getting sore, before you can start noticing their limping or things like that. And as they can progress longer in practice without those, those kind of visual cues, you can use that as a, as a method to progress as well. And then this is something that uh, Dr. Walter Barty showed you. This is really, really important to me. Um, but the nice thing about this for me is that we have baseline data on all of our guys. And we have data in the weight room as well. We use elite form in the weight room so I can see what they were doing. How much weight were they pushing? How high were they jumping? Um, what were their right to left change of directions, high accelerations, decelerations? How were they before they got hurt? And then it's not just, are they balanced? It's where were they at before they got hurt? And as we start to approach where they were pre-injury, we know we're kind of getting somewhere and that we can continue to progress. And then finally, for me, it's return to play doesn't mean stop rehabbing. Um, it's not over once they're on the field. Um, we need to continue to progress this person because a lot of times they're just because they're back on the field does not mean that they're 100%. Um, we like to use the weight room as a continued rehab. We have an outstanding resource here in our, in our strength and conditioning program. And these guys are, are, are top notch. So I can go in there and, and, and give them some, okay, add this or add that. And the, the guys are so sick of rehab and they, they don't even know they're getting rehab. They're in the weight room and they're, they're, they think they're working with their guys. They think they're back, but these guys are getting some of the work done for me. And then it's just coming in the athletic training room for five or 10, 15 minutes and doing some maintenance stuff because soreness and, and the weakness can be a huge complication and setback uh, for these guys if they stop working too early. And that's all I got. Thank you very much for letting me be a part of this. That was great, Jeremy. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Uh, let's see if we have any questions here. Uh, please put them in the Q&A if anybody has any questions. Is Dr. Metzl still with us here? All right. Yeah, quick question. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, quick question for you. I, I had a question as far as limitations and drawbacks as far as the, using a parse device and how long has this been sort of uh, been pioneered since you've been doing it? Yeah, so um, the parse device uh, was kind of first started use in about 2011. And then in high level athletes really shortly thereafter, kind of 2012. And, uh, you know, the, probably the, I don't know that there are tremendous limitations. It's all, you know, kind of risk benefit, probably the, the, I think initially maybe the, the most challenging aspect is that you're not visually going to see the full extent of the Achilles, which I think when you first start, if you're used to doing it open, it's a, it's a bit of a change, uh, because you can't truly visualize the full edges of the rupture and see, um, you know, see exactly how much tendon you bring back together. That being said, the strength of the, um, the three sutures, and in particular with the addition of that lock suture, it's very close to an, the strength of an open repair. So I think what, once you do a few and you see that the clinical outcomes are good, it's very well supported by, by the biomechanical literature. So I think the drawbacks are, are very low and the outcomes, again, if you look at like I shared that meta-analysis, uh, it's equivalent to an open repair in terms of re-rupture risk with a decrease in wound complications and improved um, outcome scores and faster return to sport. So it's, I think it's well supported in, in many aspects. Josh, I remember when our uh, mentor uh, first did it on uh, one of the, I guess he was an all pro NFL defensive end at the time, everybody thought he was crazy. Um, and uh, I know you feel confident enough. I, are you, you're doing it in your NFL players, right? Yeah. Yep. We just did one. Um, we just did one last week. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I think it goes both ways. I, I, I don't, I, I'm about 50, 50 in terms of me doing pars versus open. I use a very small sort of mini incision open. I haven't flipped over to doing my athletes that way because I, I, I use such a small incision. But I, I think one important take home from, from Josh's point is that if that's your way of doing it, it's, it works. It's just as strong. and You can feel comfortable um, that it's going to work at the highest levels. I think that's one of the take, take homes for me. I think the wound is such a big deal. I think this is one of the few times where I think the size of the incision is actually important. 
And, and so whether it's a mini open or using the pars, um, I, I think we need to minimize that and clearly shown that it works. Great. It looks like we got a question from Jeremy here. So it says, is there any special taping that you like to do for a synosmosis injury once they return to participation? Yeah, um, we do, um, and the name of it just, just escaped to me, but we do do a lot of um, supportive tape jobs, but it's, it's mainly going to be kind of return to play stuff. Um, gosh, I can't remember the name of it now. Um, but it's a, it's basically just a um, kind of support using a piece of uh, elastic on tape and, and grabbing the, the kind of the end of the foot, kind of doing a neutral subtail or neutral type of tape job. But um, really we just do, you know, a rigid tape job inside the boot or inside the shoe, the cleat. And then um, we've tried to do some of those takeo braces. We, we, we've kind of had some good success with the bracing. So a combination of a heavy tape job, um, with those taco braces and then a spat. We are, we are very pro spat around here. We feel like the spat, anything we can do to, to, to provide support. So a uh, spat would definitely be one. Um, and then that taco brace and, and I, sub Taylor sling, that's what it's called. I, the, the name of it escaped me there for a second, but we, we do that usually right off the bat um, to kind of keep them in a sub Taylor neutral position um, to, to keep them kind of the rest in the ankle, so. Jeremy, I have a question for you. You, you just brought it. You just brought it up, but it tends to be controversial in the sports world, not just in the uh, in, in the Nike world. And I sort of have, have had myself embroiled in, in it, um, and they love me for it. Talk to me about spatting. What's your feeling on spatting? You just said that, that we certainly do it at Alabama. Um, give me some of your thoughts behind spatting the foot and ankle for for playing, et cetera. And, and why we why we choose to do it because it certainly can be controversial um, in the in the athletic training world. For us, it's it's, it's controversial in two places. Um, one is you know we're a Nike school and they're very much against it. But <laughs> um, they're they're you know everything we do in athletic training, this is everything you do in medicine is in surgery is is we're trying to you know at first do no harm, right? So we're trying to provide as much. Uh, support. We're trying to find evidence-based literature that proves, and, and there is there is literature out there that supports that um, spatting a shoe provides increased support. So when um, a first-round draft pick comes to me and says, "I want to be spatted so I can feel supportive," we're, we're I'm not certainly not going to be the one to tell him no. Um, we we feel like there there is a a benefit to it. We feel like um, it provides additional support on top of the tape job. We're not doing it in lieu of tape jobs, we're doing it in conjunction with tape jobs. So anything we can do to provide them the support that they need, everybody on our team doesn't want it. Some of them don't like it. Some of them would wear nothing if we would let them. They wanna be as, as loose as they can, but we have certain guys that, you know, as much tape as you'll wrap around their shoe, they'll take it. Um, and and we, we certainly feel like we wanna provide every protective mechanism that we can um, to our guys. And, and it, it's for a lot of athletic trainers, especially older school athletic trainers, it, I remember when I was at the Colts, Hunter Smith had a sign in his locker that said real trainers don't spat. So it, it was a, um, and, but we did, it was funny because we spatted everybody at the Colts. Um, but it's, it's something that um, we, we, at the end of the day, we want to feel like we're providing every possible thing that we can to our guys. Completely agree. Jay, do you have a question? Otherwise I got another question. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question actually. Um, so you talked about grading a synthetic sprains you know, grade one through three, um, is there some leeway as far as when you're treating an athlete in season versus out of season, maybe trying to, you know, get them through it non-optively? My feeling is it's either unstable or if it, it's stable. Um, and so I don't change, um, I don't change what I do in season or out, out of season, because if you have instability there, you have instability re regardless of in season or out of season. The other thing that I've learned is I rehab them the same way if they're out of season. Now we might not, there might, that athlete might not have similar goals and towards a time frame, but I don't set a time frame on it. And so I want to put them through that same rehabilitation because what I've learned is that's good for the ankle. You want to, you want to get the ankle moving. You want to get, you want to get the swelling out. And so I rehab them the same way in season or out of season, because to me, it's a black or white thing, unstable or unstable. Now that decision may not be black or white, but 
if they're unstable, no matter when they are, I'm treating them out of, I'm treating them surgically. If they're unstable, if they're, they're stable, non-surgically. And I'd like to say most are treated overwhelmingly are treated non-operatively. You know, we have cases like Tua's case uh, where, you know, people run with it and they think that we operate on everybody. That's not true. We operate, we operate on one, maybe a year um, at Alabama, maybe two at the most, but one really. And, and so they're uncommon to need surgery, but it, we've just had it happen in some profi high profile people. So there's a little bit of misperception that everybody gets it. And that's just not the case. Most are treated non-operatively. Great. I have a question for Dr. Mutzel. So, so Josh, this is just sort of a, a posing a, a, a question for you because Jones fractures, um, you know, they, they make all of us scratch their heads because they're so hard to heal. Um, you know, what do you, what's your feeling on you are two weeks into a season and you got a guy who's got a partial Jones fracture? Do you operate on that every time? Do you try to let them go to see if they can get through the season and just say, hey, listen, if you pop this thing fully, we're going to put a screw in it. You know, how, how are you treating those? Because, you know, we see those and, and that's not always an easy thing. You know, it's one thing, you know, and the timing of that can be difficult. What's your thought on that scenario? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, that's a great question. I think that I mean, typically for me, if we're going to try to uh, allow an athlete to play through a Jones fracture as opposed to treating it either not surgically or non-surgically, my preference would be to place a screw because I think, uh, I think the screw um, at least gives us confidence that if the fracture propagates and we're able to control their symptoms, perhaps with a clamshell orthosis, that we're going to be able to get them a little further along with, with uh, in terms of return to play. So my preference would be to fix it initially. Um, you know, it's very reasonable to try and bring them back at three to four weeks. It's also important that you get buy-in from the athlete and the team and that they understand, hey, you know, we're gonna fix this, but if you refracture, there's a chance we'll have to come back and do an exchange screw with a bone graft. But my preference would be to fix that initially because they're still going to be sore for three to four weeks anyway, if you treat it non-operatively. So I'm, my preference would be to place a screw across it, allow them to kind of rehab back. And then if we have to come back and do something more, at least we've kind of given them every advantage in terms of re returning to the sport. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's interesting. That's always controversial for us, but I, I, I think that's a, a great point. And I, I think we're, uh, you know, we're always all over the board because one of the things that's challenging with a Jones fracture surgery, as you, as you know, and, and uh, Jeremy, you know, is that, you know, you do the surgery and three days later, they have no pain. They want to walk yeah. on They're They're like, doc, I, can I go back? And, and that's always a, can be an interesting discussion with the athlete. That's where the athletic trainers come in, the coaches, all those discussions, because I always tell patients that's one surgery for some reason doesn't, doesn't tend to hurt patients. Um, and, and they want to go back like that. And, and I know yeah. Jeremy, I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way you've seen it. They all want to go back right away. Right. And that's, that's always a fight that we have, isn't it? Yeah. Trying to figure out when, Jer when and where. Yeah. Jeremy, what types of things have you seen, in, especially in patients with Jones fractures? What are the, what are the things that you think allow them to get back quicker? Is, are there, what orthotics have you used or are there rehab modalities that you've used? Because, you know, with a small incision, uh, sometimes they don't have, they don't have too much pain. Are there, are there things that you've done that you think can help get them back quicker? Um, that, you know, that kitchen sink mentality we, we talked, I talked about earlier. We, we, I like that clamshell orthosis. Um, we use that a lot. Um, shoe wear tends to be a big issue. If we can if we can find a shoe that the lateral side of that shoe sits outside of that fifth metatarsal and get the insole in there and, and almost that, that clamshell orthotic can, can act as like a, as like a splint. So the orthotic is, is huge for us, but anything we can, we can do to, in our minds that they give us a chance to make the bone heal. Um, so bone stimulators, um, the shockwave, you know, the, the shockwave is, is a big thing for us that, that has been shown to help with stress fractures and healing. So we use that, um, but we try everything that we think that is indicated for those things. Um, 
and, and kind of go from there. You know, Josh, we've done some, our engineering department has done some really cool stuff at, at Alabama. And I think one of the problems with Jones fractures is these guys slide off the end of the shoe and the fourth and the fifth drop off the shoe last and it breaks. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and in shoe orthosis helps, but we've had our engineering department do when we have a fifth metatarsal fracture, build us these 3D printed external shells that'll hook into their cleats yeah. um, mm -hmm. and wrap around custom molded, very lightweight that we attach to the edge of the shoe and, and tape onto the shoe, which acts also as an external splint. And the guys tolerate it great. And, uh, and it keeps that foot from sliding off the shoe and, and has really helped our guys, wouldn't you say, Jeremy? Yeah, um, and they tolerate that a tolerate whole lot better than the, the clamshell. The, the clamshell, I like it. I think it's it's an outstanding thing to use, but it's it's that nothing's good if they don't wear it. So that that's that's the dilemma with that. But that I've, I forgot about that. Yeah, we did that the last couple of ones we had for that carbon fiber hooked onto the cleats, and we just sp it taped it into the spat job, and it, it was awesome. Yeah, that's what I was getting after because the clamshell, it makes great sense and it, it, it fits well, but the guys don't like to wear them in their shoes. So, uh, you know, the big thing with the clamshell that I've found is, you know, typically we, we make orthotics in a non-weight-bearing position. So the problem with that is, is when, when you mold somebody non-weight-bearing or you scan them non-weight-bearing, nowadays I do 3D scans with my insoles. And the problem is, is they're going to stand and that foot's going to spread out. And if that clamshell was molded but that orthotic was was molded non weight bearing, even even if their foot's on the ground and they do a an impression tray, if they don't weight bear in that tray, for that one style of orthotic, you get a really narrow orthotic, and then when they try to stand, it's too much pressure. So I always do those when I mold those orthotics. I mold them weight bearing just for that purpose. Now you don't get a good neutral arch, but you know give and take. What are you what are you trying to achieve with that orthotic? Another question for you, Jeremy, uh, as far as performance training and athletic training uh, there at Alabama, what are, what are the, some of the neat things you guys do to prevent foot and ankle injuries to get, so we don't have to send them to Dr. Waldrop or Dr. Metzl? You know, I would say the biggest thing that we probably do is shoes. Yes. Um, we, we, um, if we can prevent the injury from happening a lot, and I, I, Dr. Waldrop probably agree to this, a lot of our, you know, early on, a lot of our foot injury issues, we, we probably would say it came from an improper shoe. Um, these guys will get a hold of a shoe that we don't want them in. And if we can get them in the right shoe and, and it's, it's gives them foot health and that, that limits the amount of injuries. And, and then the other thing is we do a ton of single leg work. I think that leg control and body control on one foot um, has a huge impact on that. So we spend a lot of time on, on one leg in the weight room and we, we spend a whole lot of emphasis on what kind of shoes they're, they're working out in and playing in. Yeah, it looks like we had a question from the audience here. Um, question again for any of anybody here. Uh, can you explain how you administered a single leg hop test is an absolute deal breaker in terms of failing means not allowed to return? Well, I can answer that. Number one, it, it, there's really no magic to it. It truly is lift the other leg and single leg hop on your toes. Um, what I have found is they can either do none, they can do about two and they fatigue, or they do 15. Like it becomes quickly obvious if they can do 15. Um, I, I, you don't, you don't, you usually have, I mean, maybe Josh has a different experience, but that you don't usually have somebody that'll do like 11 and Peter out. I mean, I mean, they either can do it or they can't do it, but it's the reason why a single leg hop test works is you also have to, you got to jump, you need the strength, you need the power. It also requires a rotational mechanism for them to get off the ground on a single leg. Um, and so it incorporates kind of all the motion. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, 15 is, is what I use. Yeah, I, I agree, Norman. You know, it's, it, it's incredible. It's so simple, but it works so well. We had a Broncos player last year who had, uh, you know, an MRI uh, was kind of equivocal, showed scarring and tearing after a high ankle injury, um, persistent discomfort. Uh, and you know, really, um, he, he could, he could actually do many football activities, but he couldn't single leg single limb hop was like the, the most difficult for him. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's simplistic, but it works really well. And I agree either they can do like one or they can do a hundred, but they can't, they can't do like 12. I agree. Yeah. <laughs>
Norm, I have a question. I have a question for you. Um, so what's your thought on, uh, you know, we, we see so much on syndesmotic malreduction, you know, the idea of, um, you know, what, what the, uh, the kind of looking at the syndesmosis uh, post-surgically. Um, what, are, what is your technique for accurately reducing the syndesmosis before you place your suture button device? So number one, I've gotten away from using the clamp. I, I mainly use manually my hands. And if you think about these, the subtle ones, it's usually a posterior translation of the fibula or external rotation. So I angle it anteriorly, um, and then I make sure I get a good kind of center to center fit of, of that. If I have any concerns, I stick the scope back in because I've scoped these and, and we'll get a good feel for that. And then x-ray wise, I actually think the lateral is the most important um, because when you get a a lateral x-ray that you can't quite get a perfect lateral because the fibula doesn't sit right, it's because it's malreduced. Um, and, and so the lateral x-ray is the most important in my mind versus even the mortise. Um, and so in conjunction, so it's lateral, I'll, I'll stick my scope back in there. Um, and then I use manual pressure and the tightrope has some forgiveness versus screws. And that's one of the advantages of the tightrope is that when you get it cinched down and you get it tight, it'll allow the fibula to find its home. And, and they've shown that, that's been shown in multiple papers in the literature that it, it allows it to find its home. And, and so you have some forgiveness there once you do it correctly. What about foot position? I do it in neutral. Um, uh, you know, some people argue do it in maximum dorsiflexion because that's what widens the mort mortise the most. But my feeling is, you know, neutral is the position for the reason. Um, and, and a little bit like you, uh, you know, saying you can't over tighten the Achilles. Um, I don't know that you can really over tighten a tightrope if you have it neutral. I've never had one that really complained about, you know, it felt okay until they came up in maximum dorsiflexions. So I do it. Um, and um, I do it in neutral, though. Some people argue that maximum door subflexion is the way to do it. A question here from the audience. Uh, for the syndesmosis or fifth met fractures, would you ever take out the hardware? My, my goal is to avoid hardware removal. I'm not a hardware removal fan. And in these athletes, um, they don't want to go back for a second surgery. So my feeling is, is leave it in. Yes, especially in the fifth metatarsal, we don't want to remove it because you can refracture. So ideally, we're not we're not taking it out. Hey, Jay. I got to run. All right. I got a, uh, um, I got a, my son's got a baseball game. But so uh, but I, I just want to thank everybody uh, for coming. Jay, you did a great job moderating. Um, Josh, Jeremy, everybody. You guys were awesome. Thank you for doing it. Uh, um means means a lot to me and great stuff i appreciate it thank you yeah thank you for including me it's an honor have a great night thank you all